And good evening, church. What a blessing it is for me to be with you again tonight. I praise God that we can gather together, open the book, learn a little more about what God requires of us, what he's taught us, the grace he's showed us. I want to say thank you for being here and for studying with me. I just pray that tonight, as we go through 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 19, we might truly see something that is really unpopular in modern times. You know, there's a there's a call God has on every believer. I'm not talking about a call of uh, like where you should go or you know something like oh you're called to be a missionary in Africa, you're called to be a worship leader, you're called to be a pastor or a custodian or whatever God has called you to be. No, it's not that kind of call. The call we speak of tonight is a universal call that every one of us who's claimed the name of Jesus Christ and say that we follow him is obligated by God's word to obey. And yet, in modern times, this doctrine has fallen by the wayside. In fact, some churches are even declaring that, that what God commands of us in this area is irrelevant. We don't need to consider it, let alone obey it. Well, what is it? We're going to let Peter show us as we look through the scripture tonight. And I just pray that as it happens, you would allow God to convict your heart and show you if you're in error, if if I'm in error as we live our lives today, what does the scripture tell us? We should examine ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith. Well, let's examine ourselves tonight to see whether or not we're in the faith. Are you ready? I trust you are. Let's go. Uh, again, this is called the Unpopular Doctrine. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you want to open your Bibles and follow along. Just to refresh you in what we talked about last week, Peter has been describing a salvation to us. He has been helping us understand and remember what God has done by bringing us into right relationship with the Lord himself through the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. Remember, just for refreshment, verse 12, it was revealed to them. He's talking about the prophets of old, those that the Lord spoke to uh, before the Lord Jesus came. It was revealed to them that you were serving that they were serving not themselves but you. As they wrote down the salvation story, even though they didn't see it, God would show them that this was for, for an audience that was coming, namely the redeemed, you and I. It, it was serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you. That's the salvation story through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit. You've been preached to, you've understood the message of God. The Holy Spirit sent from heaven has made sure that you have heard it. And it's something that angels long to look into, right? Angels don't need salvation. Why? Because they, uh, at least the angels that haven't fallen, they, they are in God's presence, right? They have not sinned against God. Now, there are angels that have rebelled. They would be what we call today demons, right? They have followed Satan in his rebellion out of heaven. They were cast out, but there is no salvation for them. Why? Because they have been exposed to the absolute perfection of God himself. They were created to worship God. They had every advantage in terms of knowing the reality of God, his power, his glory, his majesty. They rejected God. There's no salvation for that. You and I, in our willful ignorance, uh, God has mercy on us as human beings to allow us to sin against him and yet provide a way for us to be reconciled to him through Christ. The angels have no such benefit. But the, the topic that Peter's brought to us here is the topic of salvation, okay, that we have the hope that comes to us through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Look what he tells us now. He says to us, look, because God has done what God has done on your behalf to bring you into right relationship with him and allow you to enter his kingdom, you need to respond. 
How should we respond, Lord? What do you want from us? Well, I want you to prepare your minds for action. I want you to be sober-minded. I want you to be somebody that takes this seriously. You know, so many of us look at our Christianity so casually. Well, I go to church once a week. I spend my hour or two on Sunday morning or whenever uh, listening to a sermon and singing some songs with my brothers and sisters. And that's my commitment. I'm, I'm a godly person because I go through that routine every week. The Lord says to us, look, I've provided you with such a great salvation, and your response to me has to be to take this seriously and to understand that the people in your life that don't know me, they're bound for eternity without me. Are you loving them like you should? Are you loving me like you should in terms of living the way I've called you to live and taking obedience to me seriously? Well, as Peter is now going to take the action step toward his readers saying, look, this is what God's done for you. This is what you're called to respond with. We need to pay attention because we ourselves are in danger of ignoring these kinds of instructions. Get your mind right. Prepare your mind for action. Think about this seriously. Be sober-minded. This is not casual. And what's the third thing here? I want you to set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You guys need to hope in what's true. Not hope in what you want to think is true. I mean, we live in a world where, where people just make up their own morality. Whatever seems right for this person is their truth, and whatever seems right for that person is their truth. And there is no objective truth. It's all about what you feel and what I feel, and we can just make up our own truth as if we were God, and as if the one the sovereign holy one who is God does not have the moral authority to impose his righteous rules and regulations, his righteous life on us for us to obey. No, we, we don't think he has that authority. We decide that we're going to make up our own rules, our own way to live. And you can see so clearly that that's led us to nothing but disaster. So Peter, as he begins here, he's telling us, look, God's saving you. Your response? Get your mind right. Prepare yourself for action. Be sober-minded. Get serious. This is so, so eternally serious. This isn't like having a job and, oh, I don't like this job, so I'm going to quit this job and get another job. I mean, this is not casual. This is, this is a a state of mind and a response to God that has eternal consequence. All right? And he says, set your hope fully on the grace. What's grace? Remember? Grace is receiving something we don't deserve. Mercy, that's not receiving something we do deserve. For instance, if you, if you deserve God's punishment and he re withholds his punishment, you don't receive what you do deserve. That's God's mercy. If God gives us heaven through Jesus Christ, that's something we don't deserve. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Well, we're supposed to set our hope fully on that. What does that mean? That means when you encounter trials in life, when you walk the walk that God has put you on to serve him, you continually remember that you're an unworthy person saved by God's grace. You've been granted relationship with him. You've been granted eternal life with him because his love has shown you mercy and his grace has given you what you don't deserve. Praise God. Why is that important for us? Because we, we will never be defeated in this life. There's nothing that can come against us that can take this away. We, we hold on to what is eternally true rooted in Christ, we can't be moved. All right? It's so important. No matter what circumstance comes to us, we hold on to the Lord. We know that because of his grace, we will be saved. We have full hope and confidence in his promise and in what he's done. All right? And, and notice at the end of the verse, 
It's going to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What are we reminded of here? Jesus is coming again. Jesus will be revealed to all those who hate him. You and I, we know him now by the grace and mercy of God. We've asked him into our lives. We have been filled with his spirit. We study his word that we might obey all that he's commanded. We walk with him. We abide in him. The world, they reject him. But the day is coming when he will be revealed. And when all our hope will be realized if we've placed our hope in Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. This is the hope of the grace that God has given us. This is what we're supposed to prepare our minds for action about. This is, this is why he wants us to be sober-minded. It's coming no matter what we suffer here. So interesting. In fact, later on in this letter, Peter's going to say this. I just will skip ahead to chapter 4 for a second. The end of all things is at hand. Again, the focus, the culmination of salvation is guaranteed. The things we've placed our hope in, yeah, it looks like faith right now, but it will be fully realized by the promise of God. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, what? Let your behavior be controlled by the knowledge of what God has done and what God will do. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Be self-controlled. Look at your life. and We look at our lives and say, are we living the way God wants? Are we responding the way God wants? Be sober-minded. We're told again in verse 8 of the 5th chapter, be watchful. And then we're given a different reason. Uh, Not just because the Lord's coming back, but because there's an enemy that wants to kill us. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We have spiritual enemies in this Christian walk, and these spiritual enemies aren't out, out there to give us a bad day. They're out there to kill us. We need to take it seriously. We need to stay rooted in the truth. We need to put on the full armor of God. We need to be people that are pursuing the Lord Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, knowing that his command is sure and true. Now, Peter takes us into this idea. And this is really one of the most unpopular doctrines in modern times. He says, as obedient children, okay, in other words, you're a child of God, and as a saved person rooted in Christ, you're a child of God that wants to do what God says. You want to obey God. Remember Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? We're going to obey God. As obedient children, what should we do? Well, here Peter tells us, Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Well, what's the former ignorance about? That's about your past life before you knew Christ. What's this idea of passions? Those are those bodily urges. I want to do this. I want to gratify my flesh. I want to eat too much and have too much pleasure and live a life of of hedonism where there's no pain and everything I want I get. Right? That kind of life. The Lord through the Apostle Peter here says, look, Don't live like that anymore. You've come to faith in Jesus Christ. You know him now. Don't live like that anymore. Allow yourself to be sober-minded. Allow yourself to think about the truth. Get your mind right for action and put your hope in grace. You're going to be able to deny yourself if you do that. What does Jesus say? You know, if you want to follow me, What's the first thing he requires? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. He says it over and over in the Gospels. Well, here we see it played out in real life. Deny yourself. Well, I want to gratify myself in this way. Well, Jesus says, follow me. Uh, Well, I'm always used to doing this and that evil thing. Jesus says, well, follow me. This is the unpopular doctrine. The, The church today, in some cases, not all, but in some, is producing a message that says God wants you to live your best life now. 
God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have everything you want. He's on your team. He's like the genie in the bottle where you get to tell God what you want. All you got to do is name it and claim it, and God's responsibility is to give it to you. This is how it works. This is a lie right from the pit of hell. God's call for us is to be obedient, is to give up those things that the flesh wants in its passion in, in the way we used to live, and to follow him. I, I hope you can see this. Let me take you to Romans 12 for a second. I know you're familiar with this. I just want to remind you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to boss God around and ask him to get whatever you want, right? To tell him what you want to name and claim. No, he says, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does a sacrifice do? Well, the way, the way you define sacrifice is through death. A, a sacrifice dies. That's what a sacrifice does. All through the Old Testament, they sacrificed animals. They killed them. Innocent blood was shed on behalf of the guilty. All right. Paul's telling the Roman church, he's telling you and me, that because God has shown us the mercy of salvation, what do we do? We get up on the altar and we die. We're still alive, physically alive, but our agendas have been sacrificed. Our old way of life has been sacrificed. We are now walking in the newness of life that Christ has provided through his death on the cross. We offer ourselves to God. I die to my passion. I die to my pride. I die to my self-sufficiency. I die to my self-direction. I live to know you. I live to serve you, Lord. I live to follow you. Lead my life. Paul says, look, if you do that, you're holy and acceptable to God. And it's your spiritual worship. This is what God requires of those who follow him. It's much like what Peter's just told us. But Paul goes on further to say the same thing Peter's telling us in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. He says, don't be conformed to this world. Well, you know what? <laughs> There's so, so many pulpits today that say, you can live however you want. God's love is completely unconditional. You don't have to monitor your behavior. This flesh is going to do the wrong thing anyway, and God's forgiven all of us, every sin against us or against him. We're, we're, we're going to be fine. Don't worry. Live however you want to live. The Bible doesn't endorse that. Don't be conformed to this world. What should I do? I should be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do you see this here? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are called in the same way Peter calls us. What does he tell us? Set your minds for action. Get ready. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that God has given. Renew your mind. This is what Peter says, and this is what Paul says. This is what the Word of God tells us. We have to think differently now that we know the Lord. We have to get away from the world's ways and seek God's ways. It's not complicated, but it's a transforming, absolutely radical change from how people behave before they know the Lord. We don't serve ourselves anymore. We serve him. We don't love ourselves most of all anymore. We love him most of all. The essence of the doctrine comes now in verse 15 when Peter says, But as he who called you is holy... Okay, notice, you remember back in chapter 1 earlier, we, we went through the election process as God elects those who come to him by faith. This is the same God that called us. He's refreshing us from what he's taught us earlier in the letter. But he's telling us now, I want you to focus on the fact, not just that he called you, but focus on the character of who he is. The Lord is holy. The Lord is holy. What does that mean? It means the Lord is completely set apart from evil. 
The Lord is completely pure, completely blameless, completely without fault, never makes a bad choice, never responds in, a, in an incorrect way. He is absolute perfection. The Lord is holy. Well, that's great to know. The Lord is holy. Praise God. But do you see the second half of this verse? You also do what? Be holy in all your conduct. This is called sanctification. And this is the most unpopular doctrine in modern time. That we should allow our behavior to be governed by God's truth. Not by our whims, not by what we might want or not want on any particular day, but that our behavior in this life is to be governed by what God wants. I want to take you to 1 Thessalonians for a second. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul lays this out to the church at Thessalonica. He says, look, for this is the will of God. Okay, you want to know what God wants? Here's what he wants. Your sanctification. What does that mean? He wants us to be set apart. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to live life without lying, cheating, stealing, <laughs> having lustful thoughts, committing adultery, committing murder, or hating people. He wants us to live without any other gods before us. He wants us to live exactly as his word has called us to live. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, follow me. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, look, if you want to make disciples, here's how you do it. You teach them to obey everything I've commanded. Learn what God's commanded. Learn how God wants us to live and live like that. Obey him. Well, Paul's going to spell it out here in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, look, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And now he's going to list the things that he wants us to focus on that you abstain from sexual immorality. This is a huge problem in modern life, even in the church. Pornography is a click or two away for anybody that's internet savvy. We're bombarded with images all day long in, in media. And not only that, but the lustful passion of our flesh leads so many people into sexual sin. God says, get away from that. He says that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And here, Peter, or, well, in this case, Paul is telling us, look, the Spirit wants to lead you there. He wants to show you what it's like to live in holiness and honor. Cooperate with him. Abstain from sexual immorality. Don't pursue your passion. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. We, we abandon our passions, we deny ourselves so that we live well before God. And as he continues to spell it out, Paul says that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, you know, you think sexual immorality, what, what do they say in modern times? Oh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Oh, you can sin and not be held accountable for it. Oh, you can do whatever dirt you want to do, and there will be no consequence. Uh, this is, again, another lie right from the pit. I mean, God holds us accountable to live according to what he has declared. And if we think that just because everybody else is doing it or because some creative advertiser came up with a slogan that says we don't have to worry about it, that we can dismiss the fact that we're accountable to a sovereign God. If, that, if that's our posture, we need to understand that we're completely wrong, that God's word is still true and that we are still accountable. And in fact, in verse 6, Paul says, look, the Lord's an avenger in all these things. You're not only going to um, hear from him, he's going to avenge the wrong you've committed by taking advantage of somebody else's husband or wife and ruin their marriage in your sexual immorality or whatever uh, Ill, evil thing has been accomplished by disobedience. God avenges these things. And as Paul concludes this, he says, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Again, God's call for us, be set apart. 
Let the world understand that you belong to me because when they look at your life, it's such a total contrast from what everybody else is doing. Everybody else is out there serving their passions and lusts. They're, they're doing whatever they feel like doing. Let's get loaded and have fun, <laughs> right? I mean, this is the party mentality. This is the no consequence mentality. Scripture over and over tells us, look, you've been saved. You've been saved with the precious blood of Christ, more valuable than anything else in life. Get sober-minded. Prepare your hearts for action. Set your hope on God's grace. Be a person that's going to absolutely commit totally to what God calls you to do. And that contrast of seeing how you live will penetrate the heart and mind of the unbeliever as God opens their eyes to the reality of Jesus Christ. The peace that you have, the love that you show, no matter whether you're hated or loved back, the love you show, the concern you show, the, the godliness that characterizes your life will be overwhelming to the unbeliever. And as God opens their eyes, they'll come. But the point here is made again. It's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. You want to know what God wants for your life? He wants you to be holy. He wants you to live your life in a way that exemplifies what he is. Did you hear that? He wants you to live your life in a way that exemplifies what he is, who he is. He is absolutely pure. He wants us to be absolutely pure. Absolutely. Blessed are the pure in heart. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5? For they'll see God, the pure in heart. The ones who say, Lord, I lay aside evil. I hate evil. I want to walk with you. Again, how do we know what's good and evil? Well, we look at God's word for what he's told us. In the modern age, many, many churches have said, look, this is outdated. Uh, we want to allow homosexuality in the church. No problem. Well, I have nothing against having homosexuals come to church. In fact, that's a great thing. Why? Because we're all sinners. <laughs> Whether our sin is homosexuality or alcohol or sex or, or uh, greed, wh whatever our sin might be, we're all disobedient to God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. So yeah, why do you come to church? Not to be told that your sin is just fine, don't worry about it, let's have a pride parade about your sin. No, you come to church to hear the truth that God says, you're accountable to me for how you live. If you don't receive my Savior and forsake your sin, if you don't come to Jesus Christ by faith, you will spend eternity experiencing the wrath of hell, my wrath against evil forever. Yeah, come to church. Let's talk about what God says. But when the church opens its doors and says, oh, come to church and we don't care how you live. We're not going to hold you to any biblical standard because you get to decide what's right for you. And God loves you unconditionally. And he's never going to do anything to hurt you no matter how disobedient you are. This shows total ignorance of what the Word of God says. This shows total ignorance of what God has declared over and over. His wrath against sin is going to be so furious and mighty when it comes finally in the end that there's going to be rivers of blood in judgment. Read it. It's in the book of Revelation. There's going to be total devastation as God permanently eliminates evil. Do you think he's casual about it? Not at all. And that's why it's become so unpopular, because the church has based itself now in, we want you to come to church, we want you to enjoy the message and have a nice time, so we're going to stay away from doctrines like sin, we're going to stay away from doctrines like hell, we're going to stay away from doctrines like sanctification, because we don't want to call you to God's standard. It might make you feel uncomfortable. Well, I can tell you, church, God's not interested in whether we feel comfortable or not. God's interested in whether we 
submit our lives to the Savior. We receive His salvation. We're covered by His righteousness through faith in Christ. God's interested in whether we are going to survive His judgment against evil. And the only way we survive it is to know Jesus Christ. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are what? Those who are nice people, those who God loves unconditionally and never hurt? No. There's no condemnation, therefore, now for those who are in Christ. Their only refuge from God's wrath against sin is found in Christ. To know him, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. So Peter goes on, having called us to this very unpopular doctrine, the, the, the call to holiness, and he says, if you call on him, if you call on him, in other words, if you're willing to say, Lord, I believe, and Lord, I do want to know you, and Lord, I will submit my life to you. If you call on him, he describes him to us here. He's a father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. He's just called us to conduct of holiness, and now he's saying, look, pay attention. God is our father. God is watching what we do. What should we do? Look, here it is again. Conduct yourselves how? With fear. Wow. Wow, with fear. Doesn't the Bible tell us that the beginning of uh, wisdom is the fear of the Lord? I mean, what does that mean? That I, I know God loves me. Um, I know God forgives. So doesn't that mean I can live however I want to live? Here we're told, look, not, not just to pursue holiness, not just to prepare our minds for action and be sober-minded and set our hopes fully on grace. We're told, live in fear. This mighty God who will judge sin is no joke. There's, there's, there's a reason to fear. Again, in modern preaching, in many places, very unpopular. God wants you to have your best life. God's going to come through for you this year. You're going to do things you've never thought you could do because God's going to keep blessing you. and You can do whatever you want. You don't have to live in a way. Of, uh, you want to sin against God? No problem. He forgives. Now, we know God forgives. But God calls us to repentance. Repentance means we turn away from our sin. Well, the modern culture doesn't like that at all because they're being told they're guilty. Not only that, but they're guilty and in danger of being rejected by God forever through being sent to hell. The culture doesn't want to hear that. And many, many, many in the church don't want to hear that. But here we have Peter telling us exactly that. Live your life in fear throughout the time of your exile. Between now and when you go to be with the Lord, live your life in fear. Doing all you can to examine yourself, to be correct. Living the way God's called you to live. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your fathers. Again, you were ransomed. God has paid a price. The price of the death of his son. The price of his own very life sacrifices the Lamb of God. God has done this for us. We were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from our fathers, but we were ransomed not with perishable things. In other words, this wasn't like a cash exchange. What did God pay to bring us back to him, to reconcile us, to open this door? He gave the precious blood of Christ. Jesus allowed his life to be taken from him on a cross. In that moment on the cross, just to refresh you, church, Jesus experienced the full wrath of God against sin for every sin, past, present, and future. He was punished. God turned his back. Read Isaiah 53. It was the Lord's will to punish him. Wow. Wow. That's the salvation you and I are, have received through faith in Christ. That's the reason we deny ourselves now. That's the reason we pursue holiness. We 
pursue that unpopular doctrine of sanctification, to live our lives well before the Lord in obedience because God has paid such a price to make it happen. Well, this is just a taste of what's coming in this letter. I hope you can listen to what the Word of God teaches us tonight and say, Lord, I want to be exceptionally obedient. I want to forsake evil in every thought, every word, every attitude. Lord, help me know your word so that I understand what you want from me. Lord, help me submit to you in everything I think, everything I say, everything I do, that I may pursue holiness because you are holy. Yeah, it's an unpopular doctrine. Nonetheless, the scripture stands clearly to say, this is how I want you to live. There will be consequence for sin. This is how I want you to live. Live a holy life. I trust you hear what the Lord of, of all is saying to us today. Because we need to change. We need to stand up for what's right. Live the way we're called to live and be the testimony God has asked us to be through faith in Christ. I pray God blesses your church. Leave comments and questions below. And until next time, serve him well.